chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in front of you. If you want like to take that Bible home, you feel free to do so. That will be yours to keep. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold, golden lampstands, as I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles, and are not. You have found them liars, and you have not preserved, and you have not, and you have patience, and you have labored for my name's sake, and you have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the first work. Or I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. May God now receive a blessing upon the reading and hearing of his word and receive seed. This morning as we continue to navigate through this new sermon series that I have entitled, Rekindle. I want to encourage everyone that is here, if finally possible... Matter of fact, I want to challenge you to try not to miss a sermon in this series. Because I firmly believe that God wants to do something in your life. I believe that God wants to do something fresh and new. And raise you and I from this ordinary lifestyle to an extraordinary lifestyle with Him. Remember last week, we began to look at this idea of our, our first love, rekindling that first love that we had. Because it is possible for you and I to drift away from that first love. It is possible for you and I to drift away from the passion and for that excitement that we once had for Jesus Christ. If you remember last week, I said... How would you describe the Christian life? Here was my answer. The Christian life is all about an ongoing, abiding love relationship between the follower of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ himself. Because remember, we can't follow a religion. We can only follow Jesus Christ. The Christian life. The life that you and I are to live, it's all about loving Jesus Christ, not just in our mind, but also in our hearts. And I want to tell you, church, if you take your eyes off of Jesus, then just possibly, slowly, gradually, and maybe even without even notice, you will begin to drift away from that first love. You will begin to drift away from what God wants you to be in your Christian walk of life. And I'm also finding sometimes we get busy. All of us, do we not? We have schedules. We have a life. We have activities. We have deadlines. Someone said, I can't wait till I retire. And then I won't do anything. Well, some of you will tell me you're more busier than you were. And we can get caught up in life. And without any notice at all, we can slowly and gradually begin to drift away from our first love, 
drift away from Jesus. Sometimes I'm finding we can get caught up in our circumstances. We can get caught up in our problems that we're facing in life. We can get caught up in our losses, in life in itself. And just slowly and gradually, you and I can drift away from that first love. We've seen it, have we not? We've seen it over the lifetime of this church and, and other churches. People who once were on fire for Jesus, <clears throat> who were actively serving and giving in the church of the living God, and then just for a moment, they took their eyes off of Jesus. And slowly and gradually, they began to drift away. They began to drift away from Sunday school. They began to drift away from church, their daily walk with Jesus. They drifted away from their daily Bible study and prayer time. <coughs> so it is possible for a child of God, if they're not careful, to drift away from that first love. But I want to share with you something that's even more sadder than that. I believe if we're not careful, if we're not very careful, when we sit around the kitchen table at mealtime, when we sit around with our family within our home, maybe our children and our grandchildren, if we sit around during those times and we criticize the church or the pastor or those who attend, if we complain about or if we talk negative about these aspects, I firmly believe, church, we can drive a wedge between our children and God. We can drive a wedge between our children and our grandchildren and maybe even our grandchildren. We can drive a wedge between our children and the church of the living God where they don't want to serve and they don't want to give anymore in the church. And before you know it, you look around at your children and they're slowly and gradually drifting away from that first love because of the ways that we drove at home. Now, I want to tell you, it's an easy thing to sit around the table and gripe about church. I caught myself doing this in our home. <coughs> And I made a vow that when we sat around the kitchen table, we will not complain and talk about church. That's family time. And if we do, we're going to talk about how wonderful God is. Amen. We're going to talk about how wonderful every church member is. We're going to talk about how wonderful our church is. And we're going to lift up and we're going to praise the name of Jesus. Because if we drive the wedge, which possibly we have in our homes, one day we're going to be sitting in church and we're going to look around and we're going to say, huh, where's my children? Why aren't they in church? Because they drifted away from that first love. They drifted away from Jesus. So let me uh, kind of set the scene for today's message. We know, according to the Bible, that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The Bible tells us that he plays, he pays close attention to the church. Church, he knows what we do in this church. Amen. He pays close attention to those who come to the church and those who do not come. So here in our text, we find Jesus. Jesus is talking about the seven churches we know today in modern Turkey. He sends a message to John. Now, I don't know how many of you know anything about John, but if you have ever read the Gospels, John was a follower of Jesus Christ. He was a friend of Jesus. He was part of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Matter of fact, John was part of the inner circle. Those who spent more time with Jesus than anybody else. But John... Because he faithfully preached the gospel, because he faithfully stood up for Jesus Christ, he was exiled over to the island of Patmos. The word exile means a state of being barred from one's native country. John was forcibly removed from his homeland 
and he was placed over in the Alamo of Patmos. Now, I don't know if you know anything about this island, but there's nothing there. It is a rocky, barren island. It's a, it's a volcanic island. It's over on the west coast of modern-day Turkey. Do you know why he was there? The Roman emperor tried to kill him by boiling him to death for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But guess what? It didn't work. And I thought to myself, well, why didn't it work? And maybe you're thinking to yourself, why didn't it work? Because the divine hand of God was on his life. So the emperor decides to send him over in complete isolation on the island of Patmos. John's there. He's all alone on that island. And Jesus pays him a visit. And there, John receives a vision. Jesus says, John, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take some notes. I want you to write down everything I'm about to tell you. I want you to write down everything that I'm going to say to you. And then I want you to send what I write down out to the seven churches in Asia Minor. So the first church we pick up in here in verse 1 is the church of Ephesus. Paul planted this church about 400 years before this event took place. Paul was on a missionary journey. He come into this city. This city was very wicked. At that period of time in history, it was known for idol worship. It was filled with ungodliness and immorality. So Paul, he had a vision to start a church there in the city of Ephesus. Now, I want to tell you, when he started this church... It was a vibrant church. It was a healthy church. It was a passionate church. It was a church that was experiencing the power and the presence of Almighty God. It was a church that was alive in the community. It was making a difference to those around them for the honor and glory of God. Literally, this little church in Ephesus turned that pagan city upside down. For Jesus. The Spirit of God was moving in and through that church. They were a visible presence to the community. And then 40 years later, Jesus comes to John. There on the island. He says, John, I want you to write to this church. I want you to send a letter to the church of Ephesus. Because I have a word that I believe that this specific church and all churches need to hear. Look what he says again in verse 1. These things say he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now to understand what he's saying here, you need to go back to chapter 1, verse 20. You will discover that Jesus is walking among the seven golden lampstands. He's holding the seven stars in his right hand. And as you turn back there, you'll find that the seven lampstands represents the seven churches. And then the seven stars he holds in his hand, the word angels, talking to the angels, the word angels means messenger. I believe he's talking to the messengers of the church, the seven messengers, the seven pastors, the seven elders, whoever was representing the head of the church. And John says, church... I have been taking watch upon what you have been doing. Now, I want to tell you something here, y'all. Jesus was brilliant. He started this conversation and, or this letter out to this church in a brilliant way. He starts out commending them. He starts out praising them. He said, first of all, he says, you are a hard-working church. He said, you're not like the other churches. He said, you're not lazy. He said, you're not content. You're not complacent. He said, no, not at all. He said, you're at it. He said, you're actively involved. You're serving, you're sacrificing, you're giving, and you're serving. While all the other churches are just sitting around watching. You're actively in ministry as God has called you to do. So he commends them. For being a hard-working church. But second of all, he commends them for being a faithful church. 
He says, I know you face opposition. I know you have faced adversity here in this city. I know you have faced many challenges. I know it hasn't been easy for you. You could have thrown in the towel at any time, church. But you stay faithful, even in the midst. And he praised them, and he commended them for it. And number three, he says, I see that you are a discerning church. He goes, look, church. He goes, you're a great church. He said, you can spot false doctrine a mile away. He says, you know when false prophets come into the church? He says, you can recognize it, but not only that. He says, church, you don't tolerate it. Anything contrary to the gospel, anything that brings disunity to the church of the living God, anything that doesn't line up with God, you don't tolerate it. In church, that is a message to the church today. We have to take our stand, and we can't tolerate anything that's going to go against the word of God. Amen. He said, you are a discerning church, and I praise you for that. Now, as I read those verses, I think to myself, what about you? What a church. Wouldn't anyone want to be a part of that kind of church? Jesus says, hey, you're a hardworking church. He says, you're a, 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 a faithful church. He says, you are a discerning church. And I praise you for that. But then in verse 4 and verse 5, the hammer's getting ready to drop. Jesus drops a bomb on them. And he turns from this positive aspect to a negative aspect. Look what he says again. Nevertheless, he says, I have this against you. That you, church, even though you're doing all that you are doing, even though everything I've praised you for, you lost your first love. He says, remember therefore where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. He said, look church, at Ephesus, if you don't get back to that first love, if you don't get back church of doing what I've called you to do, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come and I'm going to shut you down. And I want to tell you, I've seen God shut churches down over time. And I just want to say today, he may not physically shut the church down, the door itself, but here's what he did, church. He come along because the church wasn't faithful. They wasn't doing what God called them to do. There was no passion and excitement. He plucked the Spirit of God out of that church. And now it is a dead church. With people just coming Sunday after Sunday and going back home. Jesus says, you have a heart issue. You have a heart problem. You, of all things, you have abandoned. You have walked away. You have moved away from our first love. And I wonder today, I wonder, I wonder today how many churches today he's saying that to. Church, what are you doing? What are you preaching, church? You have walked away from that first love. You have moved away from your passion and excitement for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The honeymoon's over. The fire of flames have gone out. You have lost your passion and excitement for Jesus. At one point, this church was on fire for Jesus. But they weren't careful. And the flames slowly began to burn out. Yes, they were doing everything in ministry. And it cost them greatly. Because even though they were doing everything right in ministry, they lost their first love and excitement for Jesus. Could that be the modern day church today? Could that be the hearts that's in the church today? There is no love. We gather to worship, but where's the love for Jesus? We gather here to serve, but 
who has a love for Jesus. We gather here and we know when to stand and we pick up the hymns and we sing, but where's the love for Jesus? We gather around and we worship one with another, but where's the love for Jesus? We show up. We're here, we're sitting in the pew, but where is our love for Jesus? Some of you may be teaching, and he's saying, where's your love? Some of you may be leading music, and he says, where's your love? Some of you may be in the choir, and he says, where's your love? See, the church was doing everything right religiously. They were going through the motions of ministry, but their heart was not in it. They were only serving out of obligation and a sense of duty and a sense of responsibility. And Jesus looked straight into the heart of that church and he said, church, I have an issue with that. And I want to tell you, church, if we're only here to go through the motions of worship, we are here for the wrong reasons. And God says, I have a problem with that. Now, ladies, think about this. Let's say it's your anniversary. And your husband comes home with this big arrangement of flowers. Maybe for some of you, to your delight, and maybe for others, it may be a surprise. And he comes into the house with this big arrangement of flowers in his hand. And here's what he says. Well, babe, I know today's our anniversary and I know that you expected me to get you something. I got you these flowers because I did not want to hear you complain. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do, dear. We're going to get in the car, and I'm going to drive you down to Arby's, and we're going to have an anniversary dinner. <laughs> now, come on, ladies. How many of you would like that? How many of you would be offended? How many of you would not be accepted? Hands going up. How many of you would not want to receive that kind of gesture? Because you know why? It wasn't given out of love. I honestly believe your spouses in here would take one flower with love and 50 flowers with no love. And basically, that's what Jesus is saying here. Because you gave those flowers out of a sense of duty and obligation. He says, church, you're only here out of obligation. You're only here out of a sense of duty. But you drifted away from that first love. There's no passion for Jesus. Not at all. When Jesus comes into our heart. We have that love, that excitement, and the passion. And sometimes, church, life takes us away from that. Sometimes it's people, sometimes it's circumstance, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's issues. Sometimes we just get caught up in life. And we just slowly and gradually drift away. Sometimes we can even be coming to church and working in church and serving in a church. But we're not here because we love Jesus. We're here out of a sense of an obligation and duty. And before you know it, we drift away from the church of the living God. So what do we do? How do we rekindle that first love? Well, Jesus told that first church what they had to do. He said, first of all, he says in verse 5, you got to remember. He says, consider how far you have fallen. He says, go back and remember, church. Go back and remember when your life was empty. It was hollow. It was unfulfilling. Go back and remember that life before you found Jesus. Remember how you were living? You were living in guilt, in the shame, in the punishment of sin. Remember you were spiritually dead, separated from God? But do you remember the day when the gospel of Jesus Christ captured your heart? Do you remember the day when the Spirit of God moved upon you and stirred you, and you couldn't hold on to the pew no longer, and you burst forward out of that pew and you dropped at the altar or 
somewhere and you said, Jesus, today's the day. Oh, I recognize I'm a sinner, Jesus. I am repenting from those sins. I am turning from those sins. And oh, Jesus, I'm asking you into my heart as Lord and Savior. I want to tell you, I remember that day. On fire, when you could walk on your tiptoes going out of the church. I couldn't wait to get home and tell people I found Jesus. Do you remember those days? But then we get bogged down with church and ministry and life. Before you know it, church, we don't even realize it, but we have drifted away. Drifted away from that love. And Jesus said, if you drifted away, go back and remember. Remember what life was before you found Jesus. Number two. He says, not only do you remember, he says, you've got to repent. Verse 5, he says, remember therefore how far you have fallen. He says, repent. See, any time you move away from Jesus, it's being disobedient and sin. Any time you don't love Jesus with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, it is disobedience and it's sin. And whenever we have sin in our life, the Bible says we are to confess that sin before Jesus. And I want to say today, and if you're here, and if you drifted away, then you need to come back and ask God to forgive you for what has happened in your life. But there's a final thing. I like this one. He says, finally, you need to return. He says in verse 5, Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. See, once we remember, once we repent, we need to be moving back towards that first love. I remember seven years ago, I had a couple come in and say, uh, Preacher, we were calling the quits. And I said, can you explain what calling the quits is? <laughs> what do you mean you're, you're quitting? Well, we're, we're, we're quitting on our marriage. I, I have to say that's the first time I ever heard anybody say they were quitting on their marriage. <coughs> I've heard that people say they were leaving or they were separating, whatever, but not quitting on the marriage. And I said, here's what I want you to do. Do you think this marriage can be saved? Both of them said no. I said, well, I disagree. I think it can be. So before you go make any legal decisions, before you go do anything, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and I want you to go home, or wherever you're at right now, I want you to list all the things that you did when you met your spouse. What was it that energized you? What was it that put that fuzzy feeling in your heart? You know, some of you don't know what that is yet, but you will find out. <laughs> what, what, what was it that caused you... To have the biggest grin on your, on your face when you walked into the house or you couldn't sleep that night. What was it? What was that excitement that you experienced? He said, I want you to go back and I want you to remember that. And then I want you to come back and let's talk again. So they did exactly what I said. I said, so what's the conclusion? We're calling it quits. I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do one other thing for me. If you're out of the home, I want you to come back into the home. Because I knew they were out of home because the parents had told me. I want you to come back into the home. I just want you to do an experiment for three months. And if it don't work, I'll sit down and we'll talk this all out. We'll, we'll figure it out. I want you to go back and I want you to do everything you did when you first met. Everything. Do it exactly. Matter of fact, it's a good idea for us to do it anyhow. Just go back and do what you did when you first met. You know, get that excitement back. I want to tell you something. Three months later, they come back in. The biggest grin on their face. They were on fire. I actually used them as an example down the road when I had other issues. I said, hey, call them and ask them what they did. <laughs> what was it that lit the fire in their marriage again? They went back to what they were doing when they met. Church, when you drift away, go back to where you were when you met Jesus. <coughs> Get that same excitement, that same passion in the same love that you had for him. Look, life's tough. We all know that. Church life is tough. 
And look, it's not going to get any easier. We can convince ourselves that a new president is going to solve this issue in our world. It's not going to solve it. I'm sorry. Maybe for a little bit. Maybe things will get good for a little while. It's not going to solve the problem. Because we're heading down the biblical timeline of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's all unfolding. So today, as we go through this political election, we can't get caught up in the election. We can't get caught up in what's going on within the election. Because I'm just going to be honest as I can be. I have my political affiliation. You have yours. <coughs> but I'm just going to say this in a loving way, and I know I'll get the emails to tomorrow and probably today before I even get home. But neither candidate has 100% told the truth. I'm just going to be honest with you. There's been no total honesty out of any candidate that's running. We can't get ourselves wrapped up in the candidate that's going to turn our country around. We've got to get wrapped up in the person who, and the only one who can turn it around, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And if we're not careful, the political world, it can pull us away. And before you know it, we're drifting away. There's no excitement. There's no passion for Jesus. We're so caught up in political arena, and we're not caught up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be spending our time with the gospel instead of politics. Because I want to tell you, politics is not going to save your family members. Politics is not going to save your children. It's not going to save your spouse, your brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, whoever it may be. The only buddy that's going to do that is Jesus. <clears throat> so we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Because the moment that you take it off, trouble's coming. I had a good friend of mine not long ago. He fell into ministry. I talked to him and I said, are you going to go back to preaching one day? He says, right now I'm working in construction work with my dad. Great man of God, great preacher. So I, I asked him, I was telling him what happened. He said, preacher, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, I took my eyes off of Jesus. That's all it takes. That quick. And maybe today, there's somebody here, and you're taking your eyes off of Jesus. <coughs> it can happen. And you drifted. You're here, but you drifted. You're here, but where's the love? You're here, but where's the excitement for Jesus? You're here, but where's the passion? You're just here in existence. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. And as we close today, and the Holy Spirit of God speaks to us.